section two, investment vehicle characteristics. A non-qualified stock option does not qualify, makes sense, does not qualify for special treatment accorded to incentive stock options. The biggest difference is that with a non-qualified stock option, taxable income is created to the recipient when they exercise the option. There is a short-term capital gain when the option is exercised. The short-term capital gain is on the difference between the exercise price on the contract and the market price on that date. You can use options to hedge your downside risk. For example, so it's interesting on the test. I do expect those of you that are taking 66, you guys already have your seven, you'll have more um, option questions on the 66 exam than you have in the 65. Granted, if you have your series seven, you could also take the 65 test. It doesn't matter. You can take either one when you have your series seven. But the emphasis is heavier on the 66 test for options. So let's say you bought a stock at 80. So you're long a stock at 80. So when you're long a stock, that means you bought the stock, you think it's going to go up. The risk is that it could go down. So your option is used as a hedge to protect you against where the risk is. So it says you bought a put at 74 for five. So you bought a put, bought a put with a strike price of 74 for a premium of five. So basically the test wants to see if you understand What's the worst case scenario? What's the worst that could ever happen to you? So the worst case scenario would be this stock that you just bought long goes down to zero. If this stock goes down to zero, now remember, you are out of your pocket to buy the put, the downside risk protection. That's $5 a share. The contract is good for 100 shares, so $500. So that's your premium. So you're out of your pocket, the premium. And then this is your inventory position. You have to look at where did you hedge your risk. It's possible the contract was at 80. If the contract was at 80, if it went down to zero, you'd sell your shares at 80, you would have lost $500. But in this case, you have a strike price that's less than your inventory position. It's less by a difference of six. So that's six times 100 shares. So if the stock price goes down to zero, you can sell your shares at 74. So you were out 80, you were out the five, but you're in, because that's why you bought the put, to be able to sell your shares for more than what they're currently worth, uh, you're in your pocket 74. So the most you can lose in this position, when you hedge your inventory position in this way, is $11 per share. So the $11 per share came from the $5 premium, and then the difference between your inventory and the strike price. So if, once again, it had been 80, then the most you could have lost was five times 100, 500. But in this case, we had $6 difference here, $5 difference there, so the most you can lose if the stock went down to zero would have been 1,100. That's hard to read, 1,100, $11 a share. So that's a little more complicated than I would have expected, but sometimes you might see that on the test. When you sell a covered call, what's that mean? It means you sold a call on a stock you already own. You are covered, so you are not exposing yourself to unlimited risk because you actually own the stock. A futures contract guarantees to the owner of the contract a price at which he can deliver his commodity to the seller of the contract in the future. Farmers often use these contracts to hedge risk in corn production. Commodities include raw materials or agricultural products such as sugar, corn, oil, pork bellies, gold, silver, there's many. What happens when you sell a put? What have you done if you sell a put? You have sold an obligation to buy shares at a certain price. So if you had sold this put at 74, you would be obligated to buy those shares that are now worth zero in my previous story for $74. So when you sell a put, you've sold the obligation to buy stock. 
The test does like to have insurance questions, and sometimes you guys don't have insurance licenses, which can make these questions a little bit more challenging. If you have a life insurance policy, whether or not it's a variable life or traditional whole life or variable universal life, anytime you have a cash value policy, the policy can have what we call early surrender charges. So if you take out your cash value in the beginning years, very often you don't get back what you've put in because of these surrender charges. The surrender charges on life insurance cash value policies can never affect a client's face amount. Surrender charges can never affect the face amount. The surrender charge can only affect a policy's cash value. Life insurance is one of the needs you should meet for your client. It can be sold to meet two different types of needs. One approach is to make sure that the face amount is, is enough to meet the capital needs of the family if the insured should die tomorrow. We call this the capital needs approach. So if the test talks about selling enough life insurance for what the family needs, it's called the capital needs approach. So how much would they need to pay for the funeral, maybe college expenses, pay off the house? versus the other approach, which is called the human value approach. So human value basically looks at if this person was to die tomorrow, how much are they expected to earn? How much do they earn currently? How much longer are they expected to work? So it's based upon expected earnings. Human value approach. So there's just two different ways to meet clients' life insurance needs. Remember on the test, if there's ever children involved, there's definitely a life insurance need. The cheapest way to meet someone's life insurance need is to sell them term insurance. So there's basically cash value policies and then there's term insurance. Term insurance is good for a period of time. It is cheapest in the short run. Short run, it is the cheapest. So anybody can afford to buy term insurance. It's just a matter of you know getting it, <laughs> convincing someone that they actually should buy it. It has no cash value, term insurance. If you bought 20 year level term, you'd have the same premium for 20 years. If you don't die at the end of it, oh well. Nobody's like so angry they didn't die at the end of their 20 year level term policy. The premium stays the same for 20 years. It does not have cash value. During the 20 year level term, the premium is level and the face amount is level for 20 years. It is not permanent. If somebody wants permanent insurance, they want to buy a cash value policy. So permanent policies are whole life policies. They insure you until you die. Or we say age 100. Everybody should die by age 100. I know some insurance companies are using a longer mortality table than that, but for now that's fine. So permanent policies have cash value. They're way more expensive than term insurance policies. So over time your cash value grows. If it's traditional whole life, you know exactly what it's going to be at each specific age because you know exactly what your premium is, it's fixed. And traditional whole life, they put the money into the insurance company's general account, the minimum guaranteed interest rate, you know exactly what that is. In variable life insurance, what's variable is the rate of return in the separate account. So the face amount is the least that's going to be paid in variable life. Your premium is fixed in variable life. Your cash value is going to vary over time. It is possible with variable life that more than your face amount is paid when you die. It's important to remember term insurance is renewable without a physical exam. A socially responsible mutual fund would have some sort of negative screening for certain actions depending upon the fund, including screenings for things like firearms, tobacco, conflict, diamonds, a socially responsible fund will invest in companies that are both moral and ethical. There's lots of social choice funds out there today. It's not are they right, are they wrong, it's what are they. Tips, a treasury inflation protected security pays interest, just like any other debt security, semi-annually, twice a year. Let's say you bought stock and the issuer went broke. How much will you lose? The most you can lose is whatever you invested in the company. So if the mutual fund portfolio had owned those shares, it's still the most that they can lose, whatever they paid for the stock. 
An American depository receipt is used to help an investor diversify their portfolio geographically. An American depository receipt is simpler for tax purposes than owning the foreign shares directly. There are limits for qualified plans like your 401k, your IRA, your SEP, your Simple, your KEO, your TSA. How much can you put into a variable annuity? As much as you want. If you were looking at a variable annuity on one hand and an equity indexed annuity on the other, there are some key differences. Equity indexed products are not securities. Equity indexed annuities are not securities. Where a variable annuity is a security. So that's a key difference right there. So equity indexed annuities are not securities. You can sell them with just your insurance license. There are relatively new emphasis on the test. On a variable annuity, what's the guaranteed interest rate? None. Variable annuities have no guaranteed interest rate. They are variable. But on an equity index product, there is a minimum guaranteed interest rate. Usually, the guaranteed interest rate on an equity index product is less than what you would find on a fixed annuity. If the index performs well on an equity indexed annuity, then the client will be credited with additional earnings. But the client will never earn less than the minimum guarantee. They are very complex insurance products. Most states have additional continuing education requirements you must go through before you can even sell them. So equity indexed annuities have a minimum guaranteed interest rate. This is sometimes referred to as the floor. So you'll never earn less than the floor. They also very oftentimes will have a ceiling, which is the most that you can earn. They also have what we call participation rates. Participation rates. There's different ways insurance companies set up these products to work as far as they're going to check the performance of the index to which the annuity is linked to, basically, and potentially credit you, the investor, with additional earnings. But exactly how they do that is pretty complicated and varies from one company to another. So how much they will credit you of the additional earnings, I said, is called the participation rate. So it's the percentage that the insurance company is going to share with you. For example, if an equity index annuity has an 80% participation rate and the index earned 10% this year, the client will be credited with an additional 8% of earnings. Some equity index annuities can change the participation rate on an annual basis and some cannot. You have to make sure that you understand the products that you're selling. There's different methods for determining the change in the relevant index over a period of time, including what's called the annual reset, or the ratchet method, the high water mark, and point to point. So all of these are ways in which they can look at how much additional earnings are we going to credit someone who has this equity indexed annuity. Sometimes we see these called today fixed index annuities. So there's the annual reset, annual reset ratchet method. There's point to point. And there's what's called the high watermark. So you'd really need to read uh, the information about this annuity that is provided by the insurance company to understand how this particular product works for your client. The annual reset ratchet method compares the changes in the index from the beginning to the end of each year. Declines are ignored. The advantage to this method is that gains are locked in each year. It is possible, however, that this method may be combined with other features such as lower cap rates, so that's the ceiling, and participation rates that will limit the amount of interest the client might gain each year. I would say if I had to pick which one of these could produce the greatest excess earnings, I would choose the annual reset method. May produce, may produce, because the gains are locked in annually, the greatest 
gains, greatest additional earnings. The point-to-point -point method compares the change in the index at two discrete points in time, such as the beginning and the ending dates of the contract term. This method may be combined with higher cap and participation rates, so that's an advantage of point-to-point, -point, that may credit the client with more interest. So it's nev you never really know until historical data has been collected which one would have given you the greatest excess earnings. But you need to understand point to point, so two discrete periods of time. So the beginning and the end of the contract term. Now this could be 20 years, it could be 30 years, 10 years. A disadvantage of point to point is that it relies on a single point in time to calculate interest. Therefore, even if the index that the annuity is linked to is going, up, is going up throughout the term of the investment, if it declines dramatically on the last day of the term, then part or all of the early gain would be lost. Also, since the interest is not credited until the end of the term, the client may not receive any index-linked gain if they surrender this product early. So that's point to point. The high watermark method generally looks at the index at various points during the contract, usual annual, annual in anniversaries. So annual anniversaries, where this was uh, beginning versus end, point to point. On the high watermark method, it looks at the index at various points during the contract, usually, like I said, annual anniversaries. It takes the highest of these values and compares it to the index level at the start of the term. One advantage to this method is that it may credit the client with more interest than any other method and protect against declines in the index. So, crap, I'm going to do that over. <laughs> I didn't realize I wrote it that way. Okay, so I'm going to delete this board. So I'm going to go back to before I did that. So you have to go back to, I'll just start over at this. You'll figure it out. Sorry. <laughs> Shit. That's weird. I don't know that I would have agreed to that with that. But I will have to go with what I wrote. I must have had a brain at the time I wrote it. It's important to realize that equity indexed annuities can determine how much additional earnings the client gets credited with in, in three different ways. So how the products you offer work, you'd actually have to be very knowledgeable about them. So we have three ways in which this can be done. So you have to have a basic understanding of all of these three ways. There's the annual reset, the high water mark, and point to point. Annual reset also called the ratchet method. High water mark and point to point. So a little bit about each of these. So the annual reset method or the ratchet method compares the changes in the index from the beginning to the end of each year. Declines are igno ignored. An advantage of this method is that gains are locked in each year. It is possible, however, that this method may be combined with other features, such as lower cap rates, that's a ceiling, and participation rates that will limit the amount of interest that the client might gain each year. So that's the annual ratchet method. The high watermark method looks at the index at various points during the contract, usually annual anniversaries. It then takes the highest of these values and compares it to the index level at the start of the term. One advantage to this method is that it may credit the client with more interest than any other indexing method. So the test likes that. So this one, the high water mark, may, you may earn the highest additional earnings. Highest additional earnings because they're looking for the highest watermark. It protects against declines in the index 
A disadvantage to this method is that since interest is not credited until the end of the term, a client may not receive any index-related gains should the client surrender the equity indexed annuity early. It may also be combined with other features, such as lower cap rates and participation rates, that will limit the amount of interest the client might gain each year. The point-to-point -point method compares the changes in the index at two discrete points in time, such as the beginning and the ending dates of the contract term. This method may be combined with higher cap and participation rates, those would be advantages, and this may credit the client with more interest. A disadvantage to this method is that it relies upon a single point in time to calculate interest. Therefore, even if the index that the annuity is linked to has been going up throughout the term of the contract, if it declines dramatically on the last day of the term, then all or part of the earlier gain would be lost. Also, since interest is not credited until the end of the term, the client may not receive any index-linked gain if they surrender this product early. So of the three, the one that can produce the highest additional earnings for the purposes of the test is the high watermark. Of the three, the one that locks in additional earnings every year is the annual reset, the ratchet method. The test loves if a corporation goes broke, who gets paid first? Well, we know that. We've talked about that. The IRS always gets paid first, don't they? And then what we've talked about historically is we've said secured bonds. And then we have debentures. And then we have preferred stock. And then we have common stock. Now, I want to show you a couple of new things here. We've got back wages. So the IRS is always first. And then any back wages owed to the employees, those would pay, be paid next. These persons are what we call creditors, right? These are creditors, they get paid next. And these are owners, they get paid last. So don't let that throw you off. That test is just famous for this. It's not that they really changed the test, it's that they changed the terms that they use to describe things on the test. So when does common stockholders get paid? They get paid last. They get paid after the IRS, after back wages, secured bondholders, then debentures, preferred stock, and last but not least, common. So debt is uh, of creditors, of creditors. To find the expense ratio of a mutual fund, you know you take operating expenses divided by net assets. The 12B1 fee is an operating expense. It is included in the fund's expense ratio. The largest expense of the mutual fund is the management fee. Thus, it is included in the fund's expense ratio. The sales load is not part of the expense ratio. It is not an operating expense of a mutual fund. Convertible preferred stock and convertible bonds are convertible into common stock of the same issuer. If you were to draw the bond teeter-totter and you were to find that the bond's yield to call is less than the nominal yield, then this bond must be trading at what? A premium. I cannot stress. The teeter-totter is so helpful for so many questions on your test. You have to know the teeter-totter. Discounted cash flow is a valuation method used to estimate the attractiveness of an investment opportunity. Discounted cash flow analysis uses future cash flow projections and then discounts them using a discount rate, which is often the cost of capital. When we take the future value and discount them back, we end up with their present value, which is then used to evaluate the potential for investment. If the discounted cash flow is greater than the current cost of the investment, then it is a good investment. So doing a discounted cash flow analysis is basically the same thing as doing a net present value calculation. If you're using a top-down approach, this is a quantitative approach, macroeconomic approach, where the technical analyst focuses on the economy and financial markets as a whole from the top down. The analyst would then break down the market into segments for further analysis, looking for industrial sectors that are poised to outperform the market. If you're using bottom-up, this is a microeconomic 
quantitative approach where the analyst focuses on the actual company itself, not on the industry. The theory being that it is possible for a company to perform well in an industry that is not performing well. The focus for this type of analyst is on the actual company itself. A forward contract is an agreement between two parties to buy or sell an asset in the future at a price agreed upon today. They're actually written on commodities. Futures and forward contracts are both contracts to deliver a commodity on a date in the future at a prearranged price. There are two main differences. Futures trade on an exchange and forward contracts are more specialized. They trade over the counter. Futures are highly standardized. Futures are marginable while forward contracts are not. Futures have much less credit risk than forward contracts do. Both futures and forwards are types of derivatives. You would need a Series 3 license, it's a National Commodities Futures license, to trade futures or forward contracts. With a future or a forward contract, the commodity is not exchanged for the set price until a predetermined date in the future. Thus, it's not paid for until the predetermined date in the future. So the actual exchange takes place later on. That concludes our new information for Section 2.